It is a beautiful, cold January day, as it's supposed to be in January, and we're glad to have you here with us. I have a few announcements for this morning. Lucas is helping out today. So tomorrow night is the most important council meeting, and that is where we vote on the budget and the slate of officers for 2023. And this is in preparation of our annual meeting, announcing again our annual congregational meeting on Sunday, January 29th. It's important that all the members attend. Friends are also welcome to, to attend, but only members can vote. So please plan on attending uh, the annual meeting on January 29th. Bible studies continuing in the living room. We are finishing up understanding the Bible and we will begin Revelation, certain parts of Revelation, right, Pastor Ken? It's not all of Revelation? We're going to do all of Revelation. Do all of Revelation. Okay. Six months. Six months. Okay. Um, next week, Pastor Ken and Deborah will be taking a well deserved vacation. So we will have a guest speaker. He's and he's here today. Russell, welcome. Russell Coombs from Gideon's International will be our speaker for next Sunday. So please attend. I'm sure I'll have a very, very wonderful message for us. We also may clarify the guest musician. We have a guest musician? Oh, a guest musician from Black Rock Church. Wonderful. That's great. Um, also, just to prepare ahead... Our next event is going to be our International Potluck Dinner on Friday, February 17th at 6 o'clock. So please think up your best dish of your heritage or your favorite dish that you like to prepare, and uh, please join us on that day. Also, um, the men have been very busy working on the men's room. Uh, we're starting to disassemble so that we can prepare for um, the uh, renovation of it. If you want, you could take a look uh, during fellowship hour. So right now, men and ladies will be using the ladies' room. So uh, please uh, respect each other's privacy. <laughs> Knock on the door. <laughs> okay? The door locks, yes. And last but not least... Um, whoever can help, please help us to take down uh, the Christmas decorations today. The stars are staying up, but we need to take down the tree, um, pack up the uh, scarves and the hats for Bridgeport Rescue Mission. Um, and the gloves. What, honey? The gloves. And the gloves. And the gloves. And um, also uh, the, the ribbons that are in the uh, fellowship hall. There's not a lot to do. Um, I think the hardest part is going to be getting that tree upstairs. Um, so please, if anybody can assist after the service, please do so. Birthdays for this week. Tomorrow, Matthew. Yeah. Happy birthday. 63. 64? Oh, I thought it was 60. Oh, one more year to Medicare, Matt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And Deborah Fellenbaum on January 19th. That's Friday, right? Thursday? Thursday, January 19th. So happy birthday to Deborah. Any other announcements for today? If not, let's please prepare our hearts for worship.
Good morning. Could you all uh, rise and we'll say the call to worship together, or responsively rather. Oh God, you are my God. I seek you. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. Let us worship together as a family of his making. Now we'll sing uh, hymn number 216, verse 3, and the words are right in the bulletin. we will join in the prayer of invocation. Almighty God, we give you thanks for all your mercies day by day, for life and health, for joy in fruitful labor, and blessed hours of silence and rest, for every experience that trains us to be unselfish, patient, and loyal one to another and for the call of things unseen and eternal. Grant us, we beseech you, grace to love you, who has so loved us, and to give up our lives to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. And we will continue with our prayer of confession. O God, whose goodness is real, and the multitude of your mercies innumerable. We have sinned against you and done evil in your sight. Yet because you are the God of mercy and the fountain of eternal purity, we present to you the sacrifice of a troubled spirit, begging you to let the fire of your love cleanse our sins and purify our souls. Restore the voice of joy and gladness to us. Give us the comfort of your help again. And let your free spirit establish us in the liberty of the people of God. So shall we sing of your righteousness. And our lips shall give praise in the congregation of your redeemed, now and forevermore. Hear now our silent prayers in which we seek your pardon. Almighty and eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beautiful day. Bless us, the sun that is shining outside, and your sun shining in our hearts through faith. We thank you for a warm, comfortable place together, and we thank you for the warmth we enjoy for the fellowship with one another. We also thank you for your grace and your mercy. Your blessings upon us this past week and the year so far. And always we thank you for your unfailing love and for your forgiveness. Forgiveness available to us upon our confession of its need. And truly we're needy individuals in that regard. So cleanse us from every and all sin. 
And also we ask for a refilling of your spirit that we might in this service worship you in ways pleasing and honoring, encouraging, uplifting to these gathered as well as others who are listening in. And now we ask your blessing upon us as we uh, join this time of worship. We pray this all in Jesus' name for the kingdom's sake. Amen. <laughs> So we received several donations for the memory of Greg's mother. Uh, these are from neighbors, I believe. Uh, and so we'll see that that gets uh, appropriately uh, taken care of. But uh, Phyllis and uh, the other lady, I think, across the street. Absolutely. So it was nice uh, meeting them at the uh, graveside service and uh, for their friendship and faithfulness over the years with Agnes. Grateful for that. So we continue our worship now through our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. We thank you for your faithfulness in standing with this church this past year and as we begin the new year. Yes. <laughs>
Our New Testament reading is Mark chapter 13, verses 32 through 37. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, be aware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. Thank you, Kieran. So we continue our series of messages in the parables. I think we're on number 26 today, and it's about the parable of the 10 minas. The parable of the 10 minas, this is in Luke chapter 19. <clears throat> While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable, because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought the kingdom of God was going to come at, and appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. And then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your miner has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied, because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your miner has earned five more. His master answered, you take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and you reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You know, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did put, not put in and reaping what I did not sow. Why then do you put my money on deposit, so that when I come back, I would have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, Take his mina away from him, and give it to the one who has the ten minas. Sir, they said, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. But those enemies of mine, who did not want me to be king over them, bring them over here and kill them in front of me. So the parable of the ten minas. And last week, of course, we dealt with the parable of the talents. Two parables with some similarities or one parable with some differences. Two parables with some similarities or one parable with some differences. I believe it is the former and not the latter. Why? While not discounting that there are some noticeable similarities between the two parables, there remain some major differences. Therefore, I believe what we actually have is two different parables, and that's how I'm treating it. So let me explain. First of all, we noticed that when and to whom the parable of the talents and the parable of the minas was given. The parable of the minas was shared to people as Jesus approached Jerusalem. After being in Jericho, you remember the story about Zacchaeus, the tax collector, short fellow who climbed a tree, and that recorded right before this in 
Luke chapter 19. So, Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem. The parable of the talents, though, was presented to his disciples on the Mount of Olives. And this was during the beginning of Holy Week. So, two different times. Two different audiences. Some might say, well, okay. But it was essentially the same parable. Just told and then repeated. But, A careful reading of the parables reveals substantially different details. Take, for instance, the two titles, the parable of the minas and the parable of the talents. Both are monetary amounts, but quite different in value, as I noted last week. A talent was a weight of silver, about 75 pounds, and it was equivalent to or equal to 60 minas, and a mina was equal to 100 drachmas, which was a common day's wage, about a third of a year's wages. So you can see there was quite a big difference between the value of the talent and the value of the minas. There are also some major other differences, as we will see. Differences, along with some substantial things will point out. In the parable of the talents, two of the three recipients invested and then doubled what they had been given stewardship of. And for that they received commendation and rewards. Not so with the fellow who buried his talent in a hole that he dug and then returned it to his master when the master returned. That servant received rebuke and then judgment. In today's parable, the parable of the ten minas, we have three individuals who were each given one mina, not the five, three, and one, as in the parable of the talents. They were given each according to their own ability, Matthew 25, 15. In the parable of the minas, ten are mentioned, But we're only told about three individuals, three of the ten. Why is that? Well, perhaps they represent three different responses or results. Three different responses or results. So I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. The parable of the talents and the minas were given out because a master, their master was going away. In the parable of the talents, it was a businessman who was going off for a journey for which we're not told, but he entrusted his wealth to his servants while he was away. In the parable of the minas, what we have is a nobleman who was going to a far city, no doubt it was Rome, looking for a political appointment to be made king. During the uh, Roman Empire days, The emperor was called the emperor. But what the Romans did is they conquered areas. They allowed local kings to be in authority as long as they recognized Rome and the authority of Rome. So apparently this is a reference by Jesus of one of the Herods. Now there are a number of Herods, descendants of Herod the Great. And you actually have to have a chart keep track of all the Herods during the period of the, uh, of the Gospels. In my NIV study Bible, there's a nice chart of all the Herods and his descendants. So in today's parable, this man of noble birth hands out the minas to be put to work, verse 13. They were given to his servants or slaves But this man, as he journeyed off to get appointed to be king over this area, it says he was not liked. That's putting it mildly. He was hated by his subjects. And they actually sent a delegation to the city he was going to, no doubt Rome, saying, we don't want this fellow to be our king. However, you know, as we know, it's who you know. And he had an inside track. And he got appointed anyway. And uh, when he returned, we see what he did, how he treated those people who uh, hated him, disliked him, 
in verse 27. What we have in this parable is a story within a story. Story within a story. The main focus of the parable, and remember that all parables have a main point. The main point of this is what the servants did and did not do with what was entrusted to them. Now, this is somewhat similar to the parable of the talents, but there are some noticeable differences. In the parable of the talents, as I pointed out, there were three. Each one was given uh, five, three, and then one. But here in the parable of the minas, they were all just given one mina, the equivalent to a third of a year's wages. But we are given uh, different results from these who were given these responsibilities or stewardship of. We are all given, I think this parable teaches us, we are all given some responsibilities. We are all given something to be steward of. The question is, what are we doing with what we are responsible for? What are we doing with what we are responsible for? What are you doing with what you've been given your mina? The first fellow mentioned that he took his mina and he earned 10 more. Wow, that's a pretty good return on investment. ROI is not. He earned 10 more. That's terrific. One grew into 10. The second fellow came with his mina, gave it back to the master and said, he grew it into five, five from one. Still a pretty good return on his investment. Now, this past week, I uh, met with my financial wizards to review how things went last year. And I can tell you that we didn't have quite the same results. <laughs> one going into 10 or one going into five. Although, the last quarter... Uh, there was a nice rebound. That was good. But the first three quarters, not so good. Not so good. So, this third fellow, this third fellow, who had taken his mina, and he kept it in a cloth in a safe place, no doubt in a box behind his chariot in the locked garage. Just seeing if you're following local current events and world events. Okay. He kept it in a safe place. And so when the man returned, he brought his one mina that he'd been given, and he gave it back to him. This was not what the master had in mind when he told him to take this, go and earn more with it. So instead of words of commendation and rewards that the first two guys got, he was uh, not spoken too good, was he? The first fellow who turned the one into ten was given authority over ten cities because he had been found trustworthy in a very small matter. So because he was trustworthy in a very small matter, he was given some great responsibilities over ten cities under this king. The second was also promoted, given authority over five cities because, again, he was faithful in small matters. Now, this third fellow, he had his one taken from him, and it was given to the guy who had the ten. Now, this is the exchange that the king had with this individual. I'm reading in verse 20 to verse 23. Then the other servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in. You reap what you did not sow. And the master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in, reaping what I did not sow. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit? So that when I came back, I would have collected it with interest. So, the man was fearful. And as I pointed out last week, fear will keep you from doing things. Fear will keep you from doing things. But this guy should have been fearful 
of having to report back his lack of effort and also fearful of retribution. He should have thought about, should have thought about that. So he lost his stewardship of his one mina, and it was given to the man who turned the one into ten. The one that turned the one into ten got this man's mina. Now really, if you're the king, wouldn't you do that? Wouldn't you give it to the guy that proven that he was uh, very good with his investments? But not everybody agreed with that. There were those who came and said, Sir, he already has 10. You know, this sounds like some of the socialists that we have today. They would actually take from the 10 and give to the one that had the one. That's what the socialists would do. But this king said, I'm going to reward the guy that really did something with what I gave him, turn the one into 10. And then he says this, I tell you that everyone who has more will be given out. But for the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. Now, I think if you've observed human beings and your own experience in life, you can see that this often happens in real life. People with more gain more. And people who uh, don't properly handle what they have even lose that. Now, this parable makes a point and teaches us that while we are all given some charge or responsibility, what matters is how trustworthy we are with our stewardship. How trustworthy we are in small matters determines whether we're going to be given greater responsibility. So I have a little bit of time this morning, so permit me to, uh, to share something from my own early work experience. And uh, I'm not going to be bragging here, I'm just going to be stating facts, you know. And I'm going to be giving credit to um, my parents, my grandparents, my church leaders, and my teachers. So, uh, I have to first of all tell you this. When I was uh, going from the rural grade school that I attended to the big consolidated junior high, senior high, as I was riding the bus one day, this upperclassman made fun of the clothes that I was wearing. Now, what I was wearing was, you know, okay, but it was what the farm kids wore out in the rural area. But what hurt about this was he was the older brother of a girl that I was kind of looking after, you know, looking sweet up. <laughs> I resolved then and there that that would be the last time anybody ever made fun of my clothing. So that Friday, when we went to the market, there was a clothing store in Columbia called the King Shop. I went to the King Shop, and I got myself a whole new wardrobe. I'll never forget this, because the sales clerk kept saying, do you have money? I said, I got money. And I bought this, and I went, you got money? I got money. So I got myself a new set of clothes. And ever since that, from high school and college, I was known as one of the best dressed guys on campus. So, this was in the late 60s. And you remember what people looked like in the late 60s with the hippies and the yippies and all the war protesters and whatever else. So, as a, as a Mennonite farm boy, I rebelled and got into fashion clothing. That was my former rebellion. And uh, I used to go into Harrisonburg to the, was the finest men's shop. And uh, as I was going in there, I got to know the owners and the owner's son and the people. Now, it happened that halfway through college, the scholarship that I had, which paid about half of my private school, uh, it would have paid all if I had gone to the state school, um, the scholarship was running out of money. And so they said, if you own a car, you have to sell the car and spread the value of the car over the remaining years of your college. And then if there's any difference, we'll make it up. And I said, I've had this car since I'm a junior in high school. I'm not giving up my car. I probably can find a part-time job. You know, whatever I did. I've worked part-time when I was in high school. So anyway, this clothing store that I would hang out in some, they said, you know, we've never had anybody from your college work here. Why don't you're in here a lot? Why don't you, why don't you work here? Oh, we'll give you a discount. No, that sounds pretty good to me. I said, good. And the nice thing about it is this 
door was only about two and a half mile from the college, and they pretty they let me make up my own schedule. Whenever I had some time, I would go work. And especially the store was open on Thursday and Friday night, and so I just gave up a few dates and uh, worked on Thursday and Friday night um, and Saturday. So um, after I was working there a little while, I got promoted to be an assistant buyer, an assistant manager, and then eventually the manager. Now, how did that happen? How did this Mennonite farm boy get to be the manager of this finest men's store in Harrisonburg, Virginia? Let me tell you what happened. There was usually four or five clerks that were on duty, and uh, most of these guys, when they didn't have customers to wait on, they'd hang out in the back of the store where there was this round table with captain's chairs, and usually there was a local paper there, there was a Washington Post, and there was also some magazines, and there, one of them was a trade magazine. Now, instead of hanging out back there and shooting the breeze with the rest of the guys, when I wasn't waiting on customers, I was either stocking shelves, or I was straightening up the stock, or I was sweeping the floor if it needed to sweep, or I'd vacuum, I would uh, wash the windows if it needed to be washed. Uh, and I found things, that, and if I really didn't have anything else to do, I would go read the labels on the clothing. So I was better informed as I was explaining to people why our clothes cost more than the department store down the street. And so I would study the labels, and I got to know. So anyway, the owner and the owner's son noticed my work ethic, and I got promoted. I got promoted, first of all, to be the assistant, and then the manager. And... Uh, some of the other fellows weren't too happy with that. They were there longer than me. But I was just doing what I was taught by my parents and my grandparents, my church leaders, and my teachers, to be responsible in small matters. And if you're responsible in small matters, you might be promoted. That'll be noticed. And you'll be given greater responsibility. So I told that story to help illustrate what I'm talking about today. We're all given some charge, some responsibility for something. Now, I know that some of you that are uh, like me, either semi-retired or retired, but you still, uh, we're talking here about the kingdom of God, and we don't retire from that. Some time ago, or ever Mixie across town said to Deborah, uh, when are you and Ken gonna retire? And what was your response? We're just going to die in the saddle. <laughs> just going to die in the saddle. You really don't retire from ministry. Okay? Uh, still responsible. Still using the talents and the gifts that God has given us for the kingdom. For the kingdom's sake. So how trustworthy are you in small matters? What are you doing with what you have been given? This is in the context of the kingdom of God. Are you using your gifts and the talents that God has given you? Or maybe out of fear, you're sitting back not doing anything. Not putting your talent or gifts to work. Not using it to grow the kingdom of God. Now, if that's the case, can you imagine? Eventually, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. There are two judgments. The great white throne judgment of all the unbelievers who die in their sins, the books are going to be open, their deeds are going to condemn them, they'll be off to hell. But Christians don't have to worry about the great white throne judgment. But we will all someday appear before the judgment seat of Christ when the rewards will be given out. Now, can you imagine on the great white throne judgment, the fear of those people as their deeds will condemn them? And can you imagine for Christians standing before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ as the rewards are given out, you know, jewels for our crown and all that. Can you imagine having nothing or very little to give back to the one who gave his all for us? Can you imagine how you're going to feel if that's the case? Having nothing or very little to give back for the one who left heaven, came to earth, went to the cross, bore our sin there on the cross for us did that all for us, gave his all for us. Can you imagine having nothing or very little to give back? There was a story that uh, there were two churches close by there in Millersville, Pennsylvania, and one Sunday it was heard that they were singing 
will there be any stars in my crown? And across the way, they were singing, no, not one. <laughs> you know those hymns, no, no. <laughs> so you don't want to be in that situation, standing before the judgment seat of Christ when rewards are given out. And by the way, what are we going to do with those crowns and those rewards? Are we going to parade around heaven with our crowns and with our jewels and say, yeah, look what I did. Look what I got. <clears throat> no, we're going to cast those crowns at the feet of the one who gave us all for us. But can you imagine how you're going to feel if you have very little to give back or nothing? This parable teaches us the importance of being trustworthy in small matters. Being trustworthy in small matters. Now, in the church here, there's a lot of small matters that uh, people do that uh, don't get any particular notice, doesn't show up in the annual report, doesn't show up here or there. But church could not operate if it were not for the people who do the things that are done each day, each week, each month. In fact, uh, yesterday, there was a number of men here back there disassembling the men's room. And I was handed this. This is the last piece of what was in the men's room, this piece of tile. <laughs> now, I don't know, was this on the floor, Peter, or was this on the right side? On the wall. I don't know. You did clean it, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be, it's got to be, uh, it's got to be my coaster up here. Okay? So um, our plans, uh, as we're deconstructing the men's room, and I pointed out to uh, former Pastor Hart, who was here in the late 70s and early 80s, you know, the guy that has the line of Jude Academy and his support, he said that restroom needed to be done over 50 years ago. <laughs> uh, but we, we, being the gentlemen of the church, we did the ladies' room first, took care of the ladies. The ladies got fine, the ladies got fine throne room over there. Myself. Yes. But uh, now we're going to be sharing that. So there's a lock on the door. And somebody made up some signs, they're occupied, okay, uh, <laughs> occupied men, occupied, so, uh, and there are stalls within there, you know, that's in the ladies' room, they got these stalls, okay, but uh, anyway, you can go in and lock the door, and you don't have to worry about somebody else coming in. So, uh, our men are, are laying hands on that, uh, that's after we uh, did the ladies' room over, after we rejuvenated the sanctuary here, after we did the ramp out here, and the railing. Uh, we're now doing the men's room. And uh, who knows, maybe after the men's room, the kitchen. <laughs> maybe the kitchen. Uh, so, people being faithful in small matters. The men of the church. Who all was here yesterday working on that? Jim, Matthew, Anthony, Peter, Bill. Tom. Tom. Matthew. You know, the nice thing about a small church, it's kind of hide in, kind of hard to hide in a small church. Now, over at Black Rock, big church, you know, people can sit back there and kind of, but uh, Bruce Moss mentioned this, that uh, when he was over at Grace with me, that uh, a softball, a men's softball team, but he wasn't doing a whole lot. Of, he's doing a lot more now. He said, well, it's kind of hard to hide in a small church. <laughs> it's kind of hard in a small church because everybody, uh, yeah, we got the newest members over here. We're putting them to work. Absolutely. Rebecca wasn't asked to be, didn't wait to ask. He's back there in the kitchen. And uh, Aiden, you're going to be one of the worship leaders. That's, that's good. I hear that, right? So um, being responsible in small matters is how you get promoted to greater responsibilities. Now, for some, they don't want more responsibilities. Nope. Yeah, some don't, don't want that. <laughs> but uh, generally, when you, when you want to get something done, you find somebody that's faithful and responsible. And they get asked to do. And usually they should be at the village um, when somebody was uh, given out the responsibility, you saw them take her. Those are the people that uh, got promoted. And those are the people that got bigger raises. When I first went there, uh, they used to just do the old socialist thing. Everybody just got the same increase, 3% a year. I went to a different system. I gave managers a sum of money, and I said, here, you can give this out 0 to 5% based upon how people did, what they did. 
and you're going to reward the people that are, you know, very responsible, people who don't have to be asked to do things, people who see what needs to be done, does those things. Those are the people who are going to reward that. We want to reward that kind of conduct, that kind of work. Uh, this one guy came to see me, and uh, he was upset because he didn't get a raise. And I said, well, did you ask your manager why? Yeah, well, they complained that I was taken off too many days. Always, he would always famous to take off the day before a vacation and the day after a holiday uh, and the things like that. So I said, you, you need to find, ask your manager, what do I need to do to earn more? What do I need? Well, he didn't particularly want to do more. So, okay, then you get into zero, and guess what? You're not probably going to be here next year after that because you know, we're kind of following what Jack Welsh did. You got lop off the bottom 10%. You know, reward those who are trustworthy. In small matters, they're given greater responsibility. They're promoted. So this parable teaches us that in the kingdom of God, the same principle is at work. Use the talent and the gifts that God has given you and use it to grow the kingdom using the abilities, the talents, the resources that you've been given. Being faithful in small matters is how you get greater responsibilities. And those responsibilities as exercised and carried out are going to result in words of commendation, well done, good and faithful servant, and jewels in your crown, crowns that we will then return to the Lord who enabled us because of his faithfulness to us to be able to be faithful in small matters and then serving and growing those things into greater responsibilities. This little church has been here since 1895. There are people that have kept this church going through some very difficult times. And guess what? We're still dealing with some difficult times. We haven't got back yet to uh, how we were growing for the pandemic. But I'm hoping that uh, this year we will see that uh, again coming back. We had a full church here for the music programs last year. And uh, I don't see Lori here today, but she got like 26 people here. And Beverly, you got your family, about five or six of them show up here on some Sundays, you know? So, yeah. So we got uh, some things coming up. Uh, we got the International Food Festival. Great time to invite folks. Um, the neighbor lady there uh, of Agnes, uh, we're inviting her, Phyllis, and you know Phyllis, uh, we're inviting her. So we, we have a number of events coming up this year, good opportunities to invite people to come into church, to realize, hey, this is a nice group of people, and they actually like each other, get along well, and uh, they worship God and serve the Lord, and in doing so, they hear the gospel, they haven't made that commitment, they have that responsibility. Uh, this church is uh, one of the first things we did was uh, started to add some uh, missions. And at the time, uh, you know, church was having a hard time just paying its bills and was having to use some of the endowment money. And so some people might say, well, why, why are you giving money to missions, activity outside of church to, when you've got to gotta keep the church afloat? Well, I believe churches that give to missions, God blesses. Churches that give to missions, God bless us. And so we support the Lions Jude Academy, the Bridgeport Rescue Mission, Haitian Helping Hands. Last year, 200 shoeboxes were sent through Samaritan's Purse. We gave a couple thousand dollars to Ukrainian relief. And unfortunately, that war is still going on, so the need still exists. I think that's one reason that God is blessing this church, is because we're faithful in small matters, sharing with needs beyond our own needs, sharing the gospel, spreading the word, spreading the word. And that's what the Gideons do. Gideons are very, we'll be hearing more about that next week when, when Russell was sharing. Uh, sharing the word of God in hotels and colleges and et cetera like that. Uh, it's amazing the stories that you're going to be hearing of how, how God uses his word that's been placed there. Uh, the Gideons fund this and uh, distribute that. So being faithful in small matters is the important message from this parable, the parable of the minus. And yes, in the parable of the talents, again, we saw that there were those who were responsible, given different, of, um, as they were given out according to their abilities, recognizing that 
Okay, we're not all quite the same in that way. But here in this parable, we're taught that everybody is given something. Even as last week, everybody was given five, three, and one. Everybody was given something. The question is, what are you doing with the something that you've been blessed with? Are you using it for the kingdom's sake, growing and expanding God's kingdom to the hearts and lives of others? Let us pray. Lord, indeed, you do give us various gifts and talents. You've all given us something that we're responsible for. Help us to be faithful in these small matters, and then as you give us greater responsibilities to be continued trustworthy in those as well. So we thank you for those who have been faithful in small matters over the years, in keeping this church going, and those who uh, take on other greater responsibilities. Uh, we ask that you would add to our number for your honor and glory for the kingdom's sake. Bless our efforts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now before our joys and concerns, number 520, am I a soldier of the cross? Am I a soldier of the cross? Number 520. I particularly like that last phrase, increase my courage. That helps us overcome fear. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by thy word. Amen. Please be seated. So now it is the part of the service where we get to share our joys and concerns get to share in each other's burdens. So anyone uh, have anything to share? Anthony. Uh, continued prayers for Glenn Wormy uh, for healing as he's going through issues still with his knees and also uh, Chris Matola, um, you know, family issues and also issues in our home with Carol and Myra, um, that these issues be resolved so she could be helpful with the babies again. Thank you, Anthony. Um, Marianne. I just wanted to mention uh, Ellen uh, lost her daughter. Uh, say it again? Ruth on the 10th. Thank you, Mary Jane. Matt? <laughs> I was singing. Keep the microphone so we can hear it. If you're down here, you can't hear anything. So if you're using the microphone, 
It's like this, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. I thought you had a prayer request. <laughs> he was praying everybody uses the mic. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Lisa. Thank you. Um, this was, I think, on the prayer request, but it's a young man from Canada. His name is Mike. And um, just please pray for his, just pray for him for salvation. Um, he, he left the church, and then he, he's into actually Satanism. So, But, um, but he, 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 I've told him, I, I talked to him on Facebook, and I've told him that I'm praying for him, and he says, oh, don't pray for me. So I don't think he can handle you know, so pray for him, okay? <laughs> just just um, continued prayers for my dad. Um, Jim, he's in um, rehab, so uh, for physical therapy. Prayers that he can um, get stronger so he can get home to my mom. Thank you, Anna. That was for Jim Inglis. Kathy. I just want to piggyback on that. Prayers for my dad, who's at Bishop Wiki. He tested positive for COVID. So he seems to be he seems to be doing okay, but the little progress that he made with his physical therapy is now he backslided because now he can't right. He's gotta start all over again. So sorry. We'll be praying for him. What's your dad's name? Bill. Bill. Thank you. Well, I have a praise because um, last week we went through five pianists who said they couldn't be here to play. So Karen knew two people. That was one of the five. And then um, Sarah Beckwith said, maybe the guy who plays the organ at, for the early service at Black Rock would be willing so I said, everybody pray. So anyway, he has agreed to come, and his name is Cameron Phillips. So I'm just praising the Lord for Cameron. Oh, he's not? Oh, no. Oh, it is? Okay. Here's Sarah. Gave it up to him. <laughs> so I had contacted our choir director for, for names and said, hey, maybe would Tony like to come? He's the organist who plays there. And he said, well, maybe not Tony, but... You know, I suggest Cameron Phillips, and so we got in contact with him. So, so I haven't met him, but I'm sure he'll be fine. You guys will welcome him. Yes. yes. Is that that or acapella? <laughs> <laughs> and while I have the mic, um, both a praise and a prayer request. We were praying for my mom last week. Um, she's doing much better now, but it did turn out that she had sepsis. So um, she's home from the hospital, um, is doing well, has visiting nurses coming in, and just a praise and continued prayer for her. Yep. Thank you, Sarah. Bobby over here. Oh, okay. Bobby, I didn't see your hand up. My son Todd's father-in-law. Nikki is his wife, and he's around. He's between Kathy and... What's your name? Hannah's age. Same thing. Dad's in the hospital. He's had sepsis. He's, he's been in the hospital since March. They have now moved him to hospice. Oh, so we need prayers for the whole family. His name is Tim, and my daughter-in-law is Nikki. And Todd is his. Thank you, Bobby. Anyone else? I just, um, I don't know, Facebook seems to be my uh, mode of getting in touch with people, but I had noticed Deb Clark. Uh, her husband is in the hospital, and uh, just prayers. I think he had a stroke. Yeah. So prayers for Deb and her family. Anyone else? Okay, thank you for sharing, and we will take these in prayer to the Lord. So God answers prayer. The other week when that young man 
at the uh, heart issue in a football game. His teammates got on their knees, took a knee and prayed. And people all over the country prayed. And the young man actually visited the team yesterday. And so uh, there is power in prayer. It moves God to do things, and it also unites people. And as people are united in prayer, that also uh, causes uh, a positive response from God. So let us pray. Let us join together and pray for these individuals. Lord, you know all the names and all the situations, circumstances of the people we've mentioned here, a lot of health issues, uh, and perhaps there are other concerns that uh, weren't shared publicly or better on hearts. So we present all these things before the throne. We ask for your uh, great power to be brought to bear for your honor and glory and for the needs of these individuals. And now we close by praying the way your son taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for now and forever. Amen. Amen. Parting hymn is number 492, number 492, verse 1. Number 492. Verse 3, notice this is, what have I to fear? You don't want to fear, we want to be faithful. Verse 3. What have I go and share your peace and your love this week, Lord, and help us indeed to be faithful in those small matters for your kingdom's sake, honor and glory.